Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. Let's hear about this episode's topic. Hi, Kids Considered. I had a question about fevers. My partner is Ashkenazi and I am Arabic, and we have a four-year-old boy who's had some fevers recently that are unexplained recurring. And it's been suggested that he might have familial Mediterranean fevers given our family ethnicities. I was wondering if there's anything we should be on the lookout for, um, obviously in addition to or in conjunction with fevers, and whether there might be other recurrent fever syndromes we should be looking into. Great question. You know, it is it is detailed and specific to his kid. And so I think we can get in at the end and talk a little bit about fever syndromes. But maybe for the beginning of this episode, we can talk about just fevers in general. Because fevers are so common. Right. And it's very common for parents to have similar concerns where they're saying, my kid is getting fevers all the time. Is this normal? Mm-hmm. And even more so right now, there is like palpable anxiety surrounding fever, which is understandable because of coronavirus. And so I think it's important to talk about why kids get fevers, when to worry, how we should treat them. So fevers are common, and it's likely that you or your child have experienced many fevers throughout your lifetime. That's that's normal. But before we dive into fevers, I think it's important to revisit what a normal body temperature is and how our bodies generate a a temperature and a fever. Right. So normal body temperature is considered 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Or 37 degrees Celsius. Right. But every person is going to have some normal fluctuations in body temperature. So maybe one degree above or below 98.6. And lower body temperatures typically occur earlier in the day and higher body temperatures in the afternoon. Right. So usually the lowest body temperature is like three or four in the morning, and then it gets higher throughout the day and it peaks sometime in the late afternoon or sometimes the early evening. And the body temperature is controlled in an area of the brain called the hypothalamus. Right. You can think of this as your body's thermostat. So what exactly triggers the hypothalamus is that something is off and that it needs to respond by raising the body temperature or creating a fever. So those are specific things. We call them in medicine pyrogens. So pyrogens are things that might trigger the body that it needs to create a temperature. Pyre comes from a Greek root word that means fire, which makes sense because you kind of feel like you're on fire. But what are pyrogens? So pyrogens are biochemical substances that are released from either a pathogen like bacteria or a virus, and it can even be released by your own body under stress. Right. And these pyrogens kind of float around in the blood and they float by the hypothalamus and they trigger that something's off and we need to mount a defense. So we need to fight it off. And in this case, it does that by raising the temperature of the body. And the goal is making the body a less favorable host, a less favorable environment for replicating viruses and bacteria in the case of fever when there's an infection. So it's serving a purpose. Right. And so that's why we tell parents it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a fever when you're sick. It's great that your body can signal that you have something going on and mount a response to it and hopefully kill the virus or the bacteria. So that's a good thing. But we know that children seem to get more frequent and higher fevers than adults do. So this is because their immune system is still developing, it's still immature, and this may create um, pyrogens for each new infection they come in contact with, whereas many adults, they've already been in contact with many of these pathogens, and so they have immunity to these infections, and so when they get exposed to them, they're less commonly going to have a fever. 
And their temperatures also tend to go higher than we see in adults, which can make them feel miserable. And at times it makes them not want to eat and drink well. Their heart beats because they're more dehydrated and because of the fever can be really fast. And so all of those things make both pediatricians and parents worry and seek medical attention. So we've talked about what a normal body temperature is and what causes the body to mount a fever. Let's talk about what we consider an actual fever, the definition of fever. This is always a good one and one that I stress to all parents in my clinic because there are many times when your child may feel warm or something seems a little bit off, but it's not quite a fever. So a real fever is considered to be a core body temperature of 100.4 or greater. Mm -hmm. And the body temperature can be taken in several different ways, including rectally. We pretty much only use that in um, babies. (laughs) For obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, yeah. But you can also do it through uh, uh, one of the devices that measures it through the ear, or you can do it under the tongue or the armpit or even on the forehead. And um, currently during coronavirus, um, a lot of places are doing temperature screening with the um, infrared thermometers that measure by pointing towards your forehead or other area. Mm -hmm. Minimizes actual contact, which would be good in this situation. It's important to know that each location is going to give you a slightly different reading. So some studies have shown that rectal and ear are going to be the most accurate to what your core body temperature is. And we'll post a table of sort of different temperature readings and how they compare on our website. Now, when I was growing up, my mother used to take her back of the hand and put it on my forehead and say, gee, I don't, I, I think you have a fever. So can we, can we trust that kind of feel for the fever? It was not just when you were a kid, surprisingly, one of the few things that, I mean, is still, is still going on. It's a constant. It is constant. It's a constant. And I actually am a very big believer in mom instincts or dad instincts, but, We should look at the data because actually people have studied this, which is a great study in my opinion. So studies have compared maternal touch with a thermometer for temperature measurements in sick kids with fever. What this study showed was that the diagnostic sensitivity of maternal touch for fever was pretty good. So 70 to 97 percent versus how specific it was for fever. There was a wide range, 20% to 90%. So what this study showed us was that maternal touch is more useful at excluding fever than actually ruling it in. So they're pretty good at saying, no, my kid doesn't have a fever, but they were not as good when they said like, oh yeah, I think that he or she has one at it being accurate. So the take-home point then would be that if the mom or the dad feels the kid's forehead and says, I think they have a fever, it'd be worth measuring to (laughs) confirm that, right? (laughs) Right, exactly. So I'm surprised how many people don't have a thermometer in their home. And so it's definitely a worthwhile purchase when you have a newborn. It's actually something that I give to my friends in their like um, baby shower packages because it's so useful to have at home. But if the mom or dad feels the forehead and says, I don't think you have a fever then that's pretty accurate, right? Correct. So you should measure the temperature, but we specifically want to talk about newborns and infants because this is when we get most concerned for fever. Because that may be really, really important for the newborns because that could indicate um, a serious infection if they really have a fever. Um, Their immune systems are immature, Um, And even if they have even a slight fever, that may indicate a serious invasive infection that they need to be evaluated and treated for. And specifically, we're talking about babies up to 90 days of age that we definitely recommend seeking attention to if they have a fever. So in this case, they need to be seen right away. And depending on their specific age, there's going to be a workup. So we don't need to get into all the specifics here, but typically younger babies, we're more concerned, obviously, and older There's some different things, but they will have blood tests. They'll look at urine studies to make sure the baby doesn't have a urinary tract infection. And in younger kids, we actually also do a lumbar puncture. And that's when they take a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid to make sure that the baby doesn't have meningitis. Mm -hmm. A spinal tap, yeah. 
And so that's why we do recommend for young children, for babies, we want to get, really get an accurate uh, reading. And so that's why we do recommend doing the rectal temperature um, in these young babies, because we really need to know that. Right. So for older children, many times the fever is something that can be managed at home and not even require a trip to the doctor's office. Right. So let's talk about managing fevers at home and when it might be important to take your child to the physician. Okay. So let's say your two-year-old recently started daycare and has a fever. (laughs) Which was a very common culprit when kids were still going to daycare. (laughs) Right. Well, that'll come back. Yeah. And so then they wake up and they have a runny nose and low energy and you check the temperature and surprise, surprise, it's like 103. Depending on how uncomfortable your child appears, not every fever actually even needs to be treated. But if they do seem really uncomfortable or they're not wanting, they're just miserable looking, they're not wanting to eat or drink, then we want to start with an antipyretic medication. So antipyretics are medications that are designed to reduce fever. So many people would have heard of acetaminophen. That's the brand name is Tylenol. That, of course, occurs as a, a, you can get it as a generic too. There's also ibuprofen, the brand name that's common is Motrin. Um, And then in European and other countries, paracetamol is the equivalent of acetaminophen, but it basically does the same thing. Acetaminophen is safe to use at any age, but ibuprofen should not be used in kids under six months of age unless you consult with your pediatrician. And it's also important to remember, as Dr. Dean pointed out, that the different names of these medications and the brand names and the generics can get really confusing for parents. So some parents have told me that they're alternating Motrin and Advil every four hours, which is actually the same medication, like guised under a different name. And so if you get too much of one medication, it can be dangerous. Yeah. So always look at the actual ingredient rather than the brand name. And then alternating acetaminophen with ibuprofen, different medications, that's commonly recommended because it does help kids keep a fever down. They work by different mechanisms. And giving appropriate doses of these medications can also be tricky because, like everything in pediatrics, they have weight-based dosing. And so as your child grows, you'll give them a little bit more. And so if the last time your kid had a fever was when they were eight months and now they're three and you give them the same amount they got when they were eight months, you're going to be underdosing them. Or if you give your younger child the same amount as your older child, you'll be overdosing them. And so there are lots of ways. Usually the bottle has a nice chart based on weight of how much you should give. And we'll also post a nice chart with weight-based dosing on the website. But of course, ask your pediatrician if you have any questions. Yeah, and a lot of pediatricians will have those charts as handouts also and make them available to you. So some other strategies are to reduce the number of layers that kids are wearing so that they're not as insulated, so the temperature doesn't go up as high. And then make sure they have plenty of fluids because remember, when you have a fever, the kids might be losing more fluids and they may end up be sweating also. And each family may have their own strategies, but old things like a grandparent may have recommended like an alcohol bath or ice baths are not recommended. Huh? What? Those <laughs> aren't recommended of... anymore? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I, I remember those. Um, but people did those when I was in training. And, you know, the kids were just miserable, as you can imagine. Yeah. yeah I mean, and I They were just miserable. Oh, God, they would just be crying and crying. It was like torturing the kids. And really, oh. we, do, we don't recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. So what about the old saying, feed a cold and starve a fever? So in children especially, I always recommend ignoring this. So while your child is ill, it's all about getting fluids into them and really as much as they can eat into them. So it's pretty normal when a child feels bad to not want to eat. But I always tell parents that they should really push the fluids. It's not as important to force solids, but hydration is key. And your kid, like you mentioned, is going to need even more because of the fever. So sips throughout the day offering, this is the one case when I'll say like, okay, maybe, you know, juice is okay, whatever they'll be able to drink, um, popsicles, other things like that. So the, the rules go out the window when that's the only thing you can get into your child. 
Right. And really, we don't worry about kids losing a little bit of weight when they're sick because they're not eating because they'll gain it back when they feel better. But one of the main complications is dehydration and we want to make sure they stay hydrated. Yeah. So we've talked about um, how to keep a fever at bay. What are some indications that you should visit your pediatrician? Mm -hmm. So in younger kids with fevers and no other symptoms, so no runny nose or cough or diarrhea, um, you may want to rule out infections like an ear infection or a urinary tract infection. And those obviously need to be evaluated by your pediatrician because they have to look in the ear and they have to dip the urine to check. And those things may actually require antibiotics. So it is important to be seen. Mm -hmm. And then if we see fever for five or more days and there's not an obvious source of infection, you know, you'd want to find out what's causing that. So that warrants a trip to the pediatrician. Or, of course, if your child's very ill appearing, is drowsy, has a severe headache or neck stiffness, a severe sore throat or repeated vomiting and diarrhea that you don't feel like you're keeping up with at home. When I talk to parents, I say that the child should have at least one wet diaper or urinate once every eight hours. And so anything less than that, I would be concerned that they're dehydrated and they should definitely be seen. Mm -hmm. And then also kids who are having any difficulty breathing, so they might have pneumonia or something. Mm -hmm. you know, if they're really having difficulty breathing, then that would be another reason to bring them in. And then kids who are um, immunocompromised, who have weakened immune systems, or for some children who have like an indwelling IV or something, you know, you need to take fever very seriously in those children and they need to be seen right away. In a previous episode that's posted, we talked about seizures and specifically febrile seizures. So definitely refer to that episode if you have questions about seizures in the setting of fever. And then one question we commonly get is, um, is the temperature too high? And is there really a magic number that could cause damage? When should they bring their kid in just because the fever is so high? So the number actually matters much less than how your child looks or acts. So many parents may have heard that fevers above 104 are dangerous and cause brain damage, but this is just not true. Really, only sustained temperatures above 108 degrees Fahrenheit or 42 degrees Celsius can cause brain damage, and it would be very, very rare for the temperature to climb that high from illness alone. It could potentially happen from heat stroke or things like a child being left in a closed car during really hot weather, but very rarely from illness alone. We commonly ask parents, you know, did they respond to the antipyretic? Did the fever get better? Um, uh, what if they don't respond? Is that like significant in any way? I know I hate this one because I am guilty of doing that too. Like, oh, when you give Tylenol, does the fever come down? And so it ingrains in parents that that is an important question. Um, it's just in our mental framework that we ask, but it's actually clinically not very important. And it doesn't tell us what's causing the fever. And so usually the better thing is to follow the fever course, which the natural course of the fever will last somewhere, usually between one to four days. And, you know, sometimes it may not come all the way down with an antipyretic. And that's okay as long as your child looks okay. Yeah. So one to four days for most community acquired infections. Yeah. Yeah. So some people think um, if you don't treat the temperature, it's just going to keep getting higher and higher and higher. Is that true? No, that's also not true. So your body has a very good um, ability to regulate. And so even if you don't give your child Tylenol, it it may still come down on its own or, you know, it's it's not going to keep going up to that, you know, 108 range. So that's not something you have to worry about. But I want to get back briefly to our listener question, which was talking about fever. His child gets frequent fevers. And because of his background and the frequency of the fevers, he was concerned for something called a periodic fever syndrome. These are rare syndromes, right? You are the expert. I mean, people see you in clinic for this, I would imagine. Yeah, we see this pretty frequently. So this is a different kind of category of fever. So before we were talking about these kind of random fevers that occur, but there's this whole category of periodic fevers that occur on a kind of a regular basis. 
And some of them are without any associated symptoms or symptoms, and they self-resolve. And the most common one that we see with this is this periodic fever, apthostomatitis, pharyngitis, and adenitis. And what that means is the periodic fever, mouth sores, sore throat, and um, swollen glands in the neck. And that's that's pretty common, and we don't know the cause of that, but kids get that. The interval uh, is usually very predictable. The parents know exactly when it's going to occur. Um, they're very regular, and, and these kids grow out of it, so so it's not not very dangerous. But there are other periodic fever syndromes. So the father mentioned um, familial Mediterranean fever, and there's a bunch of other ones too. Almost all the serious periodic fever syndromes are associated with either severe abdominal pain or swelling of the joints, arthritis, um, basically. When we see kids with those, then there's genetic testing for those to figure out what's causing that. Interesting. And you said the most common one, the I always say call it PFAPA because otherwise the name uh-huh. is long, but that will yeah. resolve. What age does it typically resolve? Do you know? So kids typically get this at about one to five years of age, and then it lasts somewhere between one year or longer, and it's different with every kid. And when parents get really tired of it, there are certain treatments you can give. Sometimes they don't work, though, and so sometimes we do result with um, end up referring them for tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, and this has a relatively high success rate, up to 80%. We do this when kids, like when the fevers are interfering with school and stuff like that. Interesting. So hopefully we were able to answer some of our listeners' questions talking both about fever and why it's so common, as well as some of these periodic fever syndromes. And of course, if you're worried, definitely talk about it more with your pediatrician and they can decide if a a referral is warranted. So I hope that we have debunked some of the common myths around fevers for you today. Mm -hmm. And let's summarize some of the main points. We discussed that a fever is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. Right. And it's your body's response to try and make your body an inhospitable place for infections. And it's not dangerous. And medicines such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen can be used to help with discomfort from fever, but they're not required. You don't have to treat every fever. And it's important to ensure that you're giving the correct doses of these medications for your child's specific age and weight. So make sure you consult with your pediatrician about this. And reasons to visit your pediatrician when your child has a fever include um, if they're less than three months of age and less than 90 days of age, if there's no identifiable source, if it's been lasting five days or more, or any kind of signs of dehydration or significant behavior changes. And of course, like I said before, I totally trust the mommy or daddy instincts. So if you're worried your pediatrician is there to help, please call your pediatrician or bring them in. And that reminds me of a joke. (laughs) I'm looking forward to hearing it. What do you feed a dog with a fever? Uh, I'm not sure. Mustard, because it works well with hot dogs. Oh, my gosh. I'm more of a ketchup girl myself. (laughs) Okay. Oh, that's funny. I actually, as a child, may have had, who knows, I got fevers all the time. And looking back, I do wonder if I had one of these periodic fever syndromes because I would get those ulcerations in my mouth always before the fever was going to start. And they would go very high, and I didn't have other symptoms like congestion or a sore throat or vomiting or diarrhea, but I have completely grown out of them. I cannot remember the last time I had a fever. And at the moment, and I'm sure for my parents, it felt really horrible and scary. You know, you could ask your father now, because one of the remarkable things about that PFAPA syndrome is the parents can actually tell you when the next one is going to occur. They can look at a calendar and say, my child does not have a fever now, but they will get a fever like Sunday the 28th or something like that. Is that because it's monthly or every child has their own pattern? The cycle is generally between three to six weeks. And every child has their own pattern. But the parents figure out the pattern, and they know when it's coming. 
So you could probably ask your father, does he remember that kind of a pattern? And if he does, I bet you had that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it turned out great. So again, <laughs> there's no sequelae. But no sequelae. Here I am to reassurance mm-hmm. that you will grow out of it. Mm-hmm. That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital.